YouTube Live, and I, this is Keith coming at you from my home office here in the northern suburbs of Minneapolis. And I'm so glad you joined us today as we're going to have a really enlightening discussion with two nurse educator experts as we talk about how to strengthen and develop clinical judgment using, I believe, an underutilized strategy of reflection, reflecting on action and what that looks like, as well as practical strategies to empower every one of you to be part of the needed change in nursing education. And if you're checking this out for the first time, the focus of this live stream with Keith RN is to support and serve your needs as nurse educators and really empower you with practical and best practice strategies to teach and develop clinical judgment with really the primary focus of preparing our graduates for real world practice. If we do that first, the NCLEX, and the NGN will take care of itself. And so with, we have an academic practice gap that we really need to, that continues to widen. And every one of us listening to this can be part of the needed change. So if you're joining us tonight, I would love to have you just put your name in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. It's really a privilege to just see educators from around the country. And so if you're joining us tonight, just uh, just put your name and, your, and where you're coming from the chat. And I'd love to introduce you and welcome you. And, you know, last month, we do these Facebook Lives every month, and last month we talked about what your questions related to clinical judgment. It's kind of like, what are your uh, questions that really need to be answered to empower you to teach and develop clinical judgment? And I basically, uh, we have a, a, these uh, Facebook Lives, they live in perpetuity on the internet. I have a YouTube channel called Think Like a Nurse, and so you can easily subscribe and access all of these um, all of these Facebook Lives. And so if you found any of the topics that we've done in the past, as well as tonight's discussion, you say, boy, I wish this faculty would have heard this. Guess what? If you go to this link right here, uh, Think Like a Nurse, the YouTube channel of Keith RN, I've got dozens and dozens of videos, prior Facebook Lives and YouTube Lives, and you all can easily access and again, share these resources to help you and your colleagues be part of the needed change in nursing education. And, you know, as you look at the beginning of a new school year, you know, our, our, our passion and our need is to implement best practices to teach and develop clinical judgment as well as prepare our graduates for practice. And so really what we're going to be doing tonight again is just um, I've got two experts that are published in the nursing literature, have spoken at conferences on this very topic of clinical judgment and the use of reflection. And I think it's time that I bring them on. And so I'm gonna begin with uh, Dr. Shelley Bissard. And Dr. Bissard, let me just, uh, is a director of the Bowling Green State University School of Nursing and associate professor, has been a registered nurse since 1996 with a background in adult medical and surgical intensive care. She's been a nurse educator since 2004, working with pre-licensure nursing students, and her research has mainly focused on teaching strategies in the development of clinical judgment. And Dr. Bussard is also an adult clinical nurse specialist and a certified nurse educator. And I'm going to give you a heads up. There's an article that you all need to uh, take a look at that is on the internet that Dr. Bussard authored in 2018 that will be the basis of this presentation. And so you can get the abstract and then find the full text in your CINAHL database. So Dr. Bassard, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And I also have one more that we kind of feel like I'm a boxing moderator. And in this corner, we have got Lisa Gonzalez. And Lisa was, has been with us in the past. Uh, Lisa is a is pursuing her PhD in nursing as a professor at the College of Southern Maryland and teaching students in both adult med surge and clinical courses. She's also a passionate nurse educator to develop students' clinical reasoning skills in the clinical environment. And she has developed a concept-based approach grounded in clinical reasoning that was published in 2018 in the Journal of Nursing Education. And before I get any further, Lisa, I just want to pop that link in the chat so our educators can see your work. 
But through her presentations and publication, Lisa is also focused on helping faculty integrate clinical reasoning and clinical judgment within the curriculum using practical and evidence-based strategies. And she also co-authored a recent article published in 2021 with uh, Ann Nielsen and Kathy Lassiter, both colleagues of Chris Tanner, which we all know who she is with the Tanner's Clinical Judgment Model in the Oregon uh, Acne Consortium. And her article is a faculty guide teaching clinical judgment and clinical reasoning skills. And that link is right here. And so Lisa and Shelley, it is a pleasure to have you here tonight. And just wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us tonight on Facebook Live. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Happy to be here. Hi, everyone. And, you know, I just basically always like to start, you know what, put a human face. You know, we can be academians, we can be published, we can be scholars, but we're just also real peeps. And you know what, I would just love to just kind of just briefly, Lisa and Shelly, just kind of share maybe your journey in nursing, nursing education. Uh, I know that you're both moms. So again, you can, you know, anything you want to say to just kind of introduce yourself to our audience as we build upon that with our hot topic of using clinical judgment and reflection activities to strengthen and develop clinical judgment in nursing ed. So I'll let whoever wants to go first. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, so hi guys. Uh, basically my journey in nurse education, it almost pretty began as a nursing student myself. I was really passionate. I came from a biology degree and I went into nursing as a second degree and I quickly recognized there was something unique about nursing and I soon learned that it was the thinking that nurses do. I was very excited about it. I thought, wow, this is like the gold coin. This is like the key to all this nurse thinking. Back then it was nursing process. We understood it to be nursing process. And then years later now, we understand it to be clinical reasoning, clinical judgment, along with nursing process and critical thinking. So my journey in clinical judgment really began, like I said, as a nursing student, and it's just been developing over time. Um, I am a homeschool mom of four, uh, one graduated, two homeschooling right now, one baby that will be in the future. So but one thing that is really neat about those two worlds is education is part of our entire life. It's my career. It's part of our home life. But I learned really quickly that you want to just simplify things as much as you can. Um, clinical reasoning, I think, is something that we can really simplify, develop in our nursing students. It is a complex skill, but there is ways to do that. So I just feel like knowing students, wanting to help them, watching them grow, it just fuels the, the passion and the fire within me for nurse education and developing clinical judgment. So there's a little, there's a little tidbit. Awesome. And what about you, Shelly? Well, I'm going to take it a little bit earlier in life, Lisa. Oh, <laughs> a little earlier. <laughs> um, so I actually knew I was going to be a nurse from about the age of 11. Um, my dad was always sick when I was growing up and we were always in the hospital. And I remember walking out of his hospital room, we were getting ready to leave, my mom and I, and there was this elderly man in a jerry chair, which of course at 11, I didn't know what that was, but he was in a jerry chair sitting at, out in the hallway and he was falling out underneath the uh, table. And of course, my mom and I didn't know what to do. So we yelled for the nurses. At that time, they were inside closed nurses stations. They were smoking in the hospital then. And they opened up the door to all this smoke coming out. And they looked out and they saw him and they're like, oh, he always does that. And they closed the door and that was it. And we left. And I just remember crying the whole way home saying, I'm going to be a nurse someday and I'm going to be a better nurse than what they were. Um, and that man has never left my mind. So obviously, fast forward, I went to nursing school. Um, I can't say I ever thought I was going to be an educator. I was going to be a nurse to take care of those patients that needed a helping hand. Um, and somewhere along the way, I ended up in academia. And the second that I did, I was like, oh, my gosh, this was what I was meant to do. This was what my journey was. And I was one set of hands. And, you know, through the 19 years, I've graduated over 600 students who are now 600 hands out there in the world taking care of patients. So um, that's kind of a, a little bit about kind of why I became a nurse and how I randomly became an educator. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's so neat to think about all the students. I was trying to count the other day. I was like, how many years have I been doing this and how many students have I probably interacted with? Mm -hmm. um, and just 
that is powerful to think about all the different people that you've touched out there. And every now and then you probably get the same from your students of like, I still remember that cheer you did, or I still remember this or that. And it makes a difference out there. So that's so cool. And, you know, I think it's important because, you know, nursing education from my perspective is a more difficult road to hold than clinical practice. So clinical practice is hard nursing education. It never leaves you. It surrounds you continually. And the challenges, especially that we face, are unique. And let's be honest, it's a joy-stealing environment if you let it. You let and it. I think you know, what I love what you both have shared is the importance of never forgetting your why and why you are doing what you're doing. We have to remind ourselves that daily sometimes. But yet, like you said, Shelly, you're impacting the next generation and either, you know, and, and, and that's where we can leave a legacy, make a difference. And I think it's important for all of us as educators, never lose sight of our why, because we can drop out of the picture if we're not careful, mm -hmm. because it's difficult. It is a hard road. So thank you for sharing. You know, one thing I wanted to share is just kind of one of the things that has brought us together is an organization I want to give a shout out to. And both of you know the importance of what Icon Ed is doing, the International Consortium of Nursing Education Outcomes. And that uh, was founded by another clinical judgment expert, uh, Marianne Jesse. And as well as got Kathy Nielsen, uh, Kathy Lassiter, and Nielsen, uh, Janet Manegel, and the two of you are kind of been on the ground floor of that organization. But I love what that organization is doing to help close the academic practice gap. We'd just like you to kind of share a highlight. Just you know, I have the link in the chat. I would encourage every one of you as educators be aware of what this group is doing. But that's brought us together because we have been done doing some research together. But I don't want to go too deep in the weeds. But give us the thirty thousand foot view from your perspectives, both Lisa and Shelley, on Icon Ed and why an educator should consider being a part of it. I don't mind giving the 30,000 view and then Shelly really was instrumental in one of the subgroup projects. So I feel like, you yeah. know, that would be neat. But basically, for my perspective, it's just been it's there's a lot of different experts that have joined this group. They're talking about clinical judgment. They're talking about the practice gap. We're trying to better understand what is where are we at with clinical judgment? Where are we at with doing assessments and evaluation? Where are we at with integration of clinical judgment within the curriculum, where are we at with even our understanding of what clinical judgment is, clinical reasoning and critical thinking, and what is that gap actually right now between what we're accomplishing in academia and what's expected in the practice world and what does that continue in education for novice nurses, there's training programs look like. So for me, it's been so energizing and inspiring. Keith, you had mentioned about remembering our why, remembering why we do this. And I feel like surrounding yourself with people that genuinely enjoy learning and growing together and discovering, I mean, there's joy and energy and power within that. And having a community come together like that with a common purpose that we're actually ma we're making a difference. We're making a difference with our students as nurse educators, but we're also making a difference to the, the nursing science as scholars coming together. So that's what has been wonderful about this group. And then, like I said, Shelly is, uh, is the lead for one of the subgroups. <clears throat> yes, our, our subgroup, which actually Lisa and Keith were on the subgroup with me, um, but we were looking at the clinical assessment tools that are out there. Like, how are we assessing clinical judgment, whether you're in a pre-licensure program or into that um, transition to practice time. And we were looking at, we did a scoping review. Um, it is with a uh, journal right now. We're trying to get it published, but we looked at a scoping review to see what is out there. What are people doing to evaluate um, clinical judgment? We found a lot of a lot of variables, but for the most part, people were evaluating at one point in time. Um, some of them were evaluating using critical thinking scales, some using Lasseter clinical judgment rubric. Um, a variety of whether it's from simulation to clinical to virtual simulation, using it for case studies. Um, so a lot of people are evaluating it. Very few were evaluating it in the practice setting. So as we look at that gap, if we're evaluating them in the academic side, how are we going to evaluate them and help them continue to grow once they become a registered nurse? So where's that gap at? What does that look like? That's where we want to then take the next step and kind of feel like 
we can kind of get a better understanding of how we can evaluate and assess our students in both um, student and then in uh, practice as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, what's really, I think, you know, as you look at nursing science, we are really a baby compared to medicine, you know, as far as the yeah. amount of years in the modern era, it's less than 150. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of uh, grounds we can break, I think, with advancing the science. Shelly, you had said something about evaluating clinical judgment with just a moment in time, and it just made me think about how important it is that we start to think about how we can track clinical judgment development throughout a curriculum and even throughout like the new graduate nurse program, because we do know clinical judgment develops over time, but the more that we can assess and evaluate the, our students' progress, I think the more um, interventions and the more we can kind of understand where maybe students struggle and with what clinical reasoning skills they struggle with so we know how to better help them. <clears throat> yeah. so, you know, we throw around these terms, Lisa and Shelley, and we've got to define them. You know, you said at least, oh, well, critical thinking, clinical reasoning, clinical judgment, and there are some out there including myself at one time saying, they're all the same. You're just saying the same thing differently. But if we're gonna have a robust discussion tonight on developing clinical judgment, we've got to concisely and briefly define each of these terms. So I'd like to start with the foundation of critical, because clinical judgment is an outcome. You know, even the end, you know, Tanner's framework communicates that, the, N the NCSBN definition says it is an outcome. Of, and, you know, of critical thinking and clinical reasoning. So let's define those early terms of critical thinking. Let's start with critical thinking, Lisa and Shelley, and define that term concisely for our audience. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is really important because way back, nurse educators would talk about, you know, students, sometimes they, they have the right thinking, but the wrong action, right? So that action that Keith is talking about is the clinical judgment or the decision, right? So for me, I feel like the relationship of them is that clinical reasoning supports clinical judgment. Critical thinking supports clinical reasoning because critical thinking is very broad. You know, you can learn critical thinking skills in, in grade school, hopefully, ideally. You know, critical thinking is you're learning how to conceptualize, you're learning how to apply information, you're learning how to analyze between information or put information together. But what information? Well, it could be any information. It's not discipline specific, but you do want those thinking skills in place of analyzing and synthesizing. You wanna be able to practice those because then you're gonna come into a nursing program or progress through a nursing program even stronger. But what information are we analyzing? What information are we synthesizing in nursing? Well, that's your clinical reasoning. Clinical reasoning and nursing is very specific um, to nursing. However, clinical reasoning is being talked about very interdisciplinary now, which is wonderful. Physical therapy is probably one of the most um, advanced professions as far as this clinical reasoning conversation that I've noticed in the literature. But clinical reasoning is specific to patient care. So really, it's not just nursing. It's physical therapy. Physicians talk about um, clinical reasoning. But it's all the intricate details that go into making that clinical judgment, that decision. So what information you're analyzing? How are you getting your observations? How are you getting your information? Well, as a nurse, you're doing it in a very specific manner. You're thinking about your own background, your own knowledge of pathophysiology. You're thinking about what you already know about that patient and their trends. And, and you're thinking about that intuition that you have, that something just doesn't feel right. And you have to consider that to get your clinical judgment. If we skip that clinical reasoning step within nursing, we might as well just have like an algorithm and a robot and we just, it tells us what to do. But that clinical reasoning part is what makes our profession really come alive. And then again, that clinical judgment is now that we've really thought about it, what's our decision? Do we monitor the patient? Do we need to take an action? Do we need to call somebody? What's our interpretation? What's our conclusion about the situation? Do we think our patient is really deteriorating? Do we think that they're okay right now? So that to me is the relationship and how I would define each. What do you think, Shelley? 
Yeah, I'd love to get your feedback. And yeah. again, we have comments. You know, I am monitoring the chat, so I want to make it very clear. Those of you that are attending live are blessed because you get to ask any question or make a comment or observation. And if you have a specific question for Shelly or Lisa, we will answer it before the, we leave this uh, live stream. So don't hesitate if you have a specific thought or anything you'd like to add to what they've shared. So please do so. And I mean, we got people saying, love it, Lisa, good stuff. And Shelly, you got something to add to that because I, and yeah. so I'd love to get your kind of how you would also kind of contribute to that conversation. Yeah, I think Lisa summed it up very beautifully. Um, the I look at critical thinking at you, and Lisa mentioned this. It's kind of like you're learning that in your grade school. You're learning that as you grow up. You know, it's the stove is hot. Don't touch the stove. I've got to think through that process. <laughs> right. So even when I'm teaching my students the difference between critical thinking and clinical judgment, I actually use everyday life scenarios, you know, like you guys, you know, of course my students, they're traditional BSN students. So they're, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old on average. So we start with your, remember when you learned how to drive a car, you know, you got in a car and you had to think about which is the gas and which is the brake and what is the blinker and what is the wipers. Now, what do you do when you get in the car? You just go. You don't have to think through all of those because that, like you said, the intuition, those steps are already there and you're able to just move forward with it. So I try to compare and help them understand that critical thinking. That's just our, you know, our basic thinking processes. Then I love how you describe the clinical reasoning as that, that knowledge part and that understanding of the information and then the action with the clinical judgment and how do you get that outcome Um and helping the students like realize that, you know, oh, wow, I gathered all this data, I've made sense of this information, and now I'm going to go forth and respond in some fashion. So um, I guess that's uh, how I would describe it. But I think, Lisa, you did a beautiful job. Yeah. And, you know, I would ask, you know, would you ladies agree that basically a clinical reasoning is really kind of a sequential step-by-step -step process that is done in a specific sequence to get to that outcome of clinical judgment. So when you look, for example, at understanding Tanner's clinical judgment model, there's four sequential steps of what are you noticing? And then what is the interpreting of what you've noticed? And then how do you respond as a nurse? And then evaluate of reflecting. You know, really when you look at Tanner's framework, would you agree that those four steps that Tanner identified are the reasoning steps that get you to the outcome of the end result of a correct judgment or anything you would add to that thought? I, mean, I, just I think it's they are, but I also think it's cyclic. Absolutely. You know, I think Absolutely. you gotta go back and forth between the steps based off of what's happening with your patient and the situation you're given. So, you know, a lot of those early stages and noticing and the interpreting are probably more related to that early critical thinking and the clinical reasoning, and then we get to the responding and the actions. Um, but I, I, it is definitely a cyclic nature. And that's kind of how I, I explain it to the students yeah. too. You're not going to just that's walk right. back in the room and, that's right. you know, go right from where you left off. You might have to go back to the noticing because something changed. Excellent. No, I was going to say the same. Actually, I was going to say the same because uh, sometimes you do have to go back and forth or you're responding and then you're like, oh, there's something new to notice. So you're back at that. But yeah. um, so but what was I going to say? I do think sometimes it helps to teach students, you know, in you can teach them in a sequential format just so that way they understand the depth of each. But yeah, I do think it's good to draw it and say, hey, yeah, you might have to go back and forth. Now, you had said something, Keith, that I thought was really interesting. So to me, when I really started to dive into what all this means and the new literature, there's so much new literature out there, everyone, about clinical reasoning. Um, you'll still see maybe in last 10 years or so articles saying they're used interchangeably. The terms are still used interchangeably true, but we have a lot more understanding of the different terms. So I feel like that's really important to understand um, as well to make sure when you're looking in the literature, you see that. <laughs> yeah. So then I've got the million dollar question to kind of preface our discussion about using reflection to strengthen and develop clinical judgment that we still got to kind of put the chicken before the egg. And that's this. Why do we as nurse educators need a framework to guide the teaching of clinical judgment? You know, why is that framework important 
And then kind of the dovetail question is, which framework should we be using? Which framework do you commend to nurse educators based on your knowledge and expertise of this topic? So I say a framework is needed simply because when I started teaching in 2004 and I was given the task of teaching nursing foundations and the early communication and professionalism and critical thinking, I sat up there with my students and I'm like, yeah, we're going to use critical thinking and you'll just figure it out as you go. And it's just the way you're going to think and you'll make decisions. And I stopped at that. <laughs> there was there was no depth to it. There was no way for me to like truly feel like I was able to teach it to them. It was just a you're going to learn this as you do your clinicals. Um, and so as I've moved on in my education, got my Ph.D., did my dissertation, I found Tanner's clinical judgment model. Um, I did my dissertation in two or my PhD in 2010, and I started my research for that probably around 2011, give or take. Um, and that's when I found Tanner's clinical judgment model. I'd never heard of it before that. Um, and I was like totally obsessed with this model. And I found also the Lassiter clinical judgment rubric, which is an evaluation tool that is um, associated with Tanner's model. So it really just helped me understand like, here is how I can teach it based off of knowing these four phases of the model. Yeah, yeah I agree. So for us, for me, um, I was introduced, I was actually introduced to Laster's clinical judgment before, and then I kind of worked backwards because yeah. my nursing program where I'm at, we adapted Laster's clinical judgment rubric as our clinical evaluation tool. And so for me, I was like, oh, this is really a great like clinical evaluation tool, like this is great. I, it really explains what nurses do. It really kind of puts it into nursing language. It doesn't leave anything out. And the reason why I was so connected with that is because I had taught at different um, programs before and I saw students struggling. They were making care plans and they were putting interventions on there that sometimes didn't make any sense. And I'm like, why do they struggle so much? Well, why they struggle is because they didn't have that thinking process behind it to come to the best intervention. And so I had asked somebody, I said, hey, what is, where did you guys come up with this tool? And they said, Lasser's clinical judgment rubric. So then I learned about Tanner's clinical judgment model as well. And I was very, um, I, I was very fond of it because I was like, wow, somebody has finally captured what nurses are thinking about all the time, all that unspoken stuff that we do. Well, like Shelly said, if we don't speak about it, if we don't talk about it, if we don't have a model or a framework that we can use, the students are going to be lost. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not even having the conversations of, hey, this is what nurse thinking looks like. This is what we're doing when we're thinking through these um, different clinical situations. Then it's really hard for students to grasp. And I agree with you, Shelly. Like, I, as a student myself, I'm like, well, I guess I'll just, you just figure it out somehow on your own, you know, it's not perfect. And then we have all these new grads that we're wondering why they struggle so much. Well, because we just kind of picked and figured out certain things, but not really, you know, and it's not until you really sit down and think about it. And it's like, what am I doing? What does, what, what else do I need to consider to pick the right intervention? What, what else do I need to put together to call the doctor and make sure I'm making sense? We have to support your conclusion, right? With your clinical reasoning. So for me, um, Oh, thank you, Diane. Poor students. Yes, it was hard being a student. From all of us, probably many of us, it was hard to be a student. We didn't even have simulation equipment back then, right? So um, now it's just it's just a lot better. But I think that as educators, we need to advocate for certain things. You know, I think as nurse educators, sometimes we're working on a dime budget and we're working short staffed. We're nurses. We we you know you know what, if we're going to do things, let's do things properly. And let's make sure that we have the knowledge that we need, the time that we need, the frameworks that we need, and we learn how to integrate these things properly. And we do so based on some good science and good evidence. So hopefully I didn't go too much on a tangent. <laughs> no, that's true. You know, what I would just add to that is that kind of just to supplement what you already said is that, you know, Tanner's framework, when you understand what Tanner did, she didn't invent the wheel. She simply looked at almost 200 articles in the 190 plus in the nursing literature on clinical judgment in the reasoning a nurse uses in the nursing literature 
and developed a practice-informed framework of clinical judgment. So there's a reason it speaks the language of practice. It came right from practice. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in essence, it's a practice-informed framework. It speaks the language of practice. And again, I think it's important for edu edu educators to remember that the NGN model, though it's similar with six steps, Tanner is the chicken that laid the egg of the NGN model and that the NGN model, though it's similar, it is distinctly different and is currently has no research to support it outside of practice. It is a measurement and evaluation model only at this time until research proves otherwise. And we don't have any research at this time to support it outside of what it was created for, which is to evaluate clinical judgment in a test item but not to teach practice. If you want to teach practice in a framework to inform practice, Tanner's framework is really, I believe, you know, where we need to lay that foundation. And as educators, embrace Tanner's framework, understand Tanner's framework to make that possible. So any thoughts or comments on that? Or would you both be in agreement in principle? I, th I think I definitely in uh, agreement in principle there. Um, and we are hearing of some schools and um, people that are using the NCSBN as their model of the school um, or how they're going to develop their curriculum. Um, you know, is it a bad thing? I don't know that it's a bad thing. I'm not going to give it a yes or a no either way. But as you said, there isn't any research to support it being used as a framework to guide a curriculum. But does that mean that there aren't going to be people out there doing that? And that's where the continued scholarship comes from. Maybe that's something that comes out of Icon Ed at yeah. some point in time. Um, I know, I believe Phil is on um, our group as well, or at least Marianne has been in contact with him. I think Lisa, you are too. Um, so maybe that's something that comes in the future. Uh, we're just not there yet, as obviously we know this is a new model. Yeah. And I mean, I do. so the thing too about Tanner's is Tanner's, like Keith was saying, you're looking at practice. And so when you're trying to teach somebody a discipline like nursing, you want to make sure, one thing that we're learning is how do you teach clinical judgment effectively, right? So what strategies do you use? One of the strategies that are starting to be proven is really effective is anything that adds that real life contextual piece, like case studies, unfolding case studies, even simulations, right? So if you're trying to, you know, develop a nurse, then you really want to What's your goal? What's your end goal? Practice? Are we looking at practice? Are we making sure that we're teaching them the language of nursing practice, the thinking of nursing practice? Or are we stopping at the NCLEX? And the two are, are they're two are different because if they were, if they were the same thing, if they were truly synonymous, now I, the NCLEX is, is, I love the work that's been done with the clinical judgment measurement model. I love the new NCLEX test items. I'm so glad that they're integrating clinical judgment. I am, this is like so important for us. But we don't, we can't stop there. We can't stop there. There's things that, I mean, even the creators of the, at the National Council of State Nursing, they would admit, they're like, these exams, they don't measure everything. You know, they just give a little bit, like a minimum competency. They, they, it's not the end all be all for, for, for us as nurses and nurse educators. So I feel like the clinical judgment measurement model, um, for me, I find it handy to think about, okay, how am I going to create my test questions? Have I put clinical cues in the test question? Have I put enough information where there might be two different hypotheses that they come up with? Have I, um, is this an action question? Do I want them to take an action? However, when I'm teaching my students, I'm really trying to teach them these practical things. Like, you know, some of my test questions are pretty high level. And so I put a lot of information, like I might have like a little piece of a chart even on test questions. And so how do they decipher and move through that information? Well, in class, that's how I talk to them. And I say, hey guys, focus observation, last year's clinical judgment rubric, focus observation. What does that mean in nursing? Well, it's usually a focus assessment. So we're talking about this disease process. Well, what's your focus assessment? What's important? How do you know if your patient's stable or unstable? So that way, when they approach these test questions that I've written, they have that framework and that thinking to be able to move through and decipher through those questions. So I feel like there's a place and a purpose for everything. But right now, if you guys are trying to integrate clinical judgment into your nursing curriculum and you want some guidance, 
There's a lot of um, articles that use Laster's clinical judgment rubric and Tanner's clinical judgment model. And there's a lot of examples of like things that are already done, journal assignments, you know, case studies, things that are already done using that framework that are really easy to integrate. And Tanner's clinical judgment model is actually the most common model integrated into nursing curriculum that we discovered in one of our um, research studies. And then Shelly, I think in the one that you led, we saw Laster's clinical judgment rubric was the most common evaluation tool. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the things I want to share with you all, number one is that here, you know, Christina had a great question that shows us why we're talking about this. I never heard of Tanner's before and just took a peek as you started to discuss it. Wow, this is great. And what I just did, Christina, for you and all other educators, if you haven't read the original article of Tanner's framework of clinical drug published in Journal of Nursing Ed, our scholarly journal of our profession, there it is. There's the link. You can download the entire PDF. It's on the internet and print it up highlight it, mark it, reread it, it'll change everything and give you that kind of, you'll see how it aligns with the NGN. So you don't have to teach the NGN specifically. You can teach practice informed thinking and the NGN will take care of itself. So I have that there and I uh, just want you to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and Lisa, you've also been talking about Tanner's rubric. I was just kind of, while you're, while you're talking, I just found a link to Lassiter's rubric, the actual, you can just download the two-sided PDF. You can see if you if there's two things for homework for all of you watching this, because this is not gonna guide the rest of our discussion on reflection. When you understand Tanner's and you understand how Kathy Lassiter, a colleague of Chris Tanner, Chris Tanner. Um, well, I'm getting some echo, I don't know what that's about, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, the bottom line is, is that those two together give you an understanding. So, anyways, um, Lisa, I want to kind of dovetail here and talk about your work in the Faculty Guide to Develop Clinical Judgment. And I do have that. And I hope that the technology is playing well. But I want you to highlight, Lisa, the four strategies that educators can use to develop clinical judgment. And uh, I'm just here. I am just. Am I coming through, Lisa? What's kind of happening? You are. It's a little like in and out, but I, I know where you're going with it, so I'll, I'll roll with it. Okay. So basically, guys, this faculty guide was um, put together with just the idea of, hey, what information out there would be really helpful for schools, for people that are, you know, trying to integrate clinical judgment into their curriculum, into their teaching and learning practices. And it's actually kind of reflective of the steps that I went through. So like it starts with just understanding the difference between critical thinking, clinical reasoning, clinical judgment. So I definitely, that's kind of like step one, I think, is to make your, put yourself a little bit in the literature, make sure you understand that. Somebody had said something about, we need faculty development in the, in the chats. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> like that's like step one is get some faculty development sessions, workshops, people coming in to talk about these things, or there's information out there. I know Maryland has all these free, like live, um, are, are these free recordings of different strategies for clinical judgment integration. Uh, but so that's the step one and then identifying a clinical judgment framework like we discussed. But a few of the different strategies are, you know, think about how you can integrate clinical judgment into your teaching and learning strategies and into your evaluation and assessment. And one thing that I'm recommending is make sure you're spending time teaching clinical reasoning and judgment, intentionally teaching or and creating these learning experiences where they can practice it. And then we can create evaluation assessment strategies to see how students are doing. So then back to teaching and learning. Well, one thing is, is to make it really transparent. So clinical reasoning is pretty complex. What nurses are doing, how we're thinking is pretty complex and we really need to break it down to students. So what does it look like? Well, you can go back to some of these tools. Last year's clinical judgment rubric does a really great job breaking down what's happening during noticing, what's happening during interpreting, what's happening during responding, and what's happening during reflecting. All those phases that I just said were tanners. So you can have clinical reasoning lectures, you can have um, 
different learning activities and strategies. Um, we're talking about reflection tonight. And I think Shelly has so many like strategies she's going to share, but conceptual learning, you know, making these concepts. So what is a focus assessment? How do you prioritize the information? Really conceptual learning is great because you group things together in a, in a more of a way that's easier to understand it. And you teach them how you can apply this concept or information across the board. So one thing that it doesn't matter what topic your students are learning, one thing that's transferable, and for me coming from another discipline, biology, that's what I learned. I said, wow, you know, I did flow pool, I did um, agency, I did travel nursing. So no matter where I was, it didn't matter because I can always use nurse thinking regardless of whatever patient I was encountering. And so whatever topic you're teaching, if you've taught clinical reasoning conceptually or even just piece by piece, then they're gonna transfer that knowledge to each and every situation. Another thing that's really important is higher level questioning, it's promoting higher level thinking. So really consider whatever teaching strategies you currently have. Maybe you use Socratic questioning in class, maybe you have case studies, Review those at the start of the semester. A lot of us are at the beginning of the semester, I believe, or we're about to begin. What does your case studies look like? What does your test questions look like? What does your questions in class look like? What, When you're pulling things up, are they higher level thinking, not simple yes, no, not simple recall, but they're needing to really sit with this information and, and think through it like a nurse would. Um, and then um, Shelly's going to talk about reflection, but absolutely reflective activities are really great ways to strengthen clinical judgment because it gives them another chance to revisit and rethink about that situation. Role modeling. If you're at the bedside, if you're talking about a patient at some point, let them in on, you know, well, this is like, this is how I would do it. This is what I would, how I would think through it and be very transparent. So they have that role model example of of you, the instructor, um, so they can understand how that clinical reasoning happens in real time. And I think another really important thing to share is to foster clinical confidence. One thing that's coming out in the literature right now is that new graduates struggle with confidence. Students struggle with confidence. They might be on the right track with their thinking, but they don't think they are or they're unsure. And so then they just they say nothing. And meanwhile, that patient is deteriorating and nobody's saying anything. So how do we do that? Well, you know, there's this old school way of, you know, eating our young, bullying, incivil behavior from students and from um, faculty, really. So we need to create a learning environments where we're like, guys, this is a safe space. Mutual respect. You're learning. Let it be messy. There's no wrong answers here. We're, we're going to work through this together. And then those kinds of safe spaces really help to develop confidence. The more times they practice this, the more times they do it. Even in simulation, I say we can rewind this simulation for all I care, because what's the point of this is not to let watch you fumble and falter and you know come to tears in simulation, but to let something sink in let you walk away with some principles that you're going to be able to carry with you throughout your nursing career and to help develop that confidence. So there's just a few basic things that are kind of written about in the article a little bit. And, you know, one question I would have, Lisa, just kind of share an example of those higher order questions, because I agree that asking the right questions in the right sequence using Tanner's framework is always a win. And so when you look at Tanner's framework, what are some of those questions that you would ask your students? Yeah, well, each week in clinical, I actually have a clinical reasoning um, uh, structure in clinical. So each week in clinical, we have different questions. Like, for example, um, on focus assessment week, I like to ask them, how, what focus assessment do they think is a priority for their patient and why? Then I like to ask them, how do, basically from their focus assessment, what types of information do they determine is important, things like that. But there's there's a different uh, few guides that you can actually find um, information. I know Ann Nielsen has a really good um, clinical judgment debriefing guide in a 2007 article, Guide for Reflection. But things like what patterns are beginning to emerge with interpreting? What's the significance of the abnormal assessment findings that you gathered? Uh, what actions, what interventions do you feel like you need to prioritize and why? So things that require a, a, a quite a bit of thinking about and talking it through 
to answer. But one thing that I feel like is really important is that you can have different questions to develop noticing, to develop interpreting, to develop responding, and to develop reflecting. Now, what's interesting is, um, I can't remember which article I just read. Um, but anyway, what's interesting is, is that there was an article that I just read that said about students are pretty can get pretty good at noticing, but sometimes their interpreting is where there's a gap. And so therefore they have a hard time responding. So how can it's it's good to ask these questions too because you're developing their thinking, but you're also assessing them in real time. So that way you can find the gaps in their thinking and their knowledge and then kind of help them fill it in. Or ident if you identify this in your group of students, then you can you can hit on that topic a little bit more to help strengthen that part of clinical reasoning. Yeah, and you know what I would briefly kind of comment is that students must understand their pathophysiology to interpret yes. the meaning of what was noticed, like the high fever, the high heart rate, the low blood pressure. All of that requires a deep understanding of pathophysiology, which again takes time, experience, and it's difficult. So that's just been my observation in nursing education. Um, I will share one's article uh, in 2007 that you did reference with. I just found that on the internet and the uh, abstract is there for anyone to get the article. Shelly, time to dig deep. I hope that I'm hearing some background and I hope that I'm still coming through, but it, uh, regardless, I'm gonna just give it to you. Now I've got your article in 2018 published in Nursing Education Today, congratulations. And share your work on reflection and how, again, because when you use reflection, Shelley, you're asking the right questions as well. So I'd love to just kind of share some of the observations that you have learned in your journey and your passion for clinical judgment and using reflection effectively. Yeah, great. Um, so it's, a, it's funny that you mentioned Ann Nielsen. Um, with her reflection guide, that's actually what got me started with the reflection journals for our students um, when I worked at my previous school. And that was part of my dissertation. So I was brought into simulation, I'm gonna call it accidentally, um, at my previous employer. It was kind of one of those, my boss got a grant for a simulator and it was sitting in the box. Remember that story from 2007, eight and nine, everybody had a simulator sitting in a box and no one knew what to do with it. Um, so I went ahead and um, started using the simulator, learned it, kind of winged winged it, learned it all on my own. You know, you didn't, there wasn't much out there at that time. Um, but then the, the dissertation and all of that that comes through, Lisa knows well about that dissertation process. Um, okay. so, um, I started looking at Tanner's model, Lester's rubric. I uh, read Neil, uh, Ann Nielsen's article and I was really intrigued about the reflection piece of it. And so um, I actually contacted her to see what her reflection journal questions looked like. She did share what those looked like for me. Um, and then I created my own reflection journal for the students. So what we had them do was they completed four simulation scenarios in one med surge semester. And they were meant to build on um, complexity. It was the same patient all four scenarios, but the patient built on their comorbidities. Um, they started out with a diabetic patient coming in and they had to take care of her diabetes. At some point, she ended up having a stroke the next time she was admitted to the hospital. Um, so it just kind of was a progressive scenario with that same patient. It was really nice to see the students like start talking to her like a real person. By the time they got to the fourth one, they'd walk in, they're like, hi, Lillian, good morning. You know, it's been a few months since I've seen you. How have you been doing? You know, and they really built a rapport with Lillian. Um, so what we had them do is we did the scenarios, we video record all the scenarios, and then the students would watch their own video recording afterwards. We do the traditional debriefing, we do the scenarios, we do the face-to-face -face debriefing session, we talk through the scenarios. That's a, Debriefing is a piece of reflection, so you have to do those guided questions during debriefing. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier, a lot of times it ends up in tears. Students come in with this very high expectation of what they're going to do, and sometimes they let themselves down. And so then that leads to a lot of, you know, tears. And so you bring in a lot of emotional support during that time. But so we do that traditional um, debriefing session, but then the students go back and watch their video recording. And there, then from there, they do the reflection journal. And that reflection journal has guided questions. And we start with noticing. 
and there's guided questions that focus on noticing. Then there's an interpreting page and your questions and you ask them specific questions like, I mean, as simple as these were the lab data that the patient had interpret these abnormal findings. Like what is it specific? You know, you can all go to your lab and diagnostic book and li list 20 different reasons why they have a high potassium, but why was it high for Lillian? And so then the students would interpret that. Um, they would also interpret the physician orders or provider orders. Why, why is intake and output ordered on this patient every four hours? Why is there an IV of normal saline at 100 milliliters per hour? Why is this specific to this patient? Um, and then we got into the responding and they would have to say, this is the intervention I did when I was with Lillian and this is why. But I should have done this intervention first. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So they have to kind of look at like, why did they choose to prioritize what they did and what would I have done differently? Um, and then they get into the reflection piece of Tanner's model. And what they're doing is now they're reflecting on what did you see of yourself in that video? You watched yourself. What did you do well? Yeah. What are you taking away from that? What are you going to improve on as you move, move into your next clinical, as you move into becoming a nurse? What types of things do you want to do better? What do you want to change? What do you want to keep the same? Because it's not always, I just did this horrible. It might be like, wow, I can't believe that I sat down next to my patient and I gave them therapeutic communication. You know, like I, I felt comfortable sitting down and holding her hand and I didn't know I could do that. So it's, a, you know, not only the negatives, but the positives as well in that time. Um, so we really um, do this journaling and what in the um, article that I have published, I have a couple of them published with using Lassiter's rubric and the reflection. Um, but essentially it was really comparing that first scenario, reviewing that reflection journal. And I did qualitative and then I looked at the themes, compared it to the fourth journal. Yeah. And I wanted to see, can I see growth in your clinical judgment from the first to the fourth journal? And it was amazing to read these journals. Um, it was a lot of reading. I'm not going to lie. They were like 10 pages long each. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they put a lot of effort into them. Um, but the first journal, the students were so brief on their answers. And by the time they got to the fourth journal, they were much more in depth. They were giving, you know, excellent answers. They were understanding why they prioritized their interventions. They were recognizing the um, the skillfulness of their interventions or lack of skillfulness in their interventions. But then they were even more into that reflecting on action where they're saying, this is what I'm going to do moving forward. Um, so that was really uh, eye-opening I will say with those reflection journals, one of the other keys to that as the educator is those students are placing a lot of time into to watching the video, doing the journals. I then have to put in a lot of time to grade those journals. And what I'd like to do is I, I leave them comments. If you know their thought process is right on target, I will give them a, you know, a kudos. You did this is excellent. This is right on target where you need to be. Um, maybe they interpreted a lab value and it was not quite quite right for that patient's situation. And I would give them a cue. I would give them an, you know, a, a piece of information and say, you know, this is a good start to trying to uh, understand this lab value. And then I would kind of go through the explanation of why it might be different. Um, so it's really giving them a lot of that feedback into the um, reflection journal as well. And then hopefully they're looking at your feedback and they're using that to continue to grow. Um, as they move forward. So, and one thing, Shelly, you didn't mention that needs to be mentioned is the improvement in the student's clinical judgment using Lassiter's framework to evaluate it from the first to the fourth. You had some quantitative metrics in your 2018 article that we shared, and you need to share that. Yeah. Um, so I think I went on to my qualitative article instead of the quantitative, but um, yeah, we, I did also one with um, looking at last year's rubric, looking at the outcomes from the first to the fourth scenario. So it was the same scenarios and I evaluated every um, scenario using last year's rubric and we did a scoring system. So if you have never seen the um, last year's rubric, I know, I think Keith put in the um, link there for the article, there is 11 dimensions in the uh, rubric. So there's the, the noticing, I think there's what, two or three dimensions under noticing and then interpreting, there's like three 
maybe four dimensions and then uh, responding and reflecting have some dimensions. Um, but then she evaluates it as exemplary, accomplished, developing, and beginning. And then each one of those dimensions, you can give it a scoring mechanism. So we just did it as a one, two, three, four type of scoring mechanism. Um, and then compared the first scenario, I averaged out the um, scores from the first scenario, compared it to the fourth scenario, and the jump in their clinical judgment was absolutely amazing um, from that first to the fourth. So we had some great um, significance in that change in their or improvement in their clinical judgment. Shelly, it, really cool. it was a P of 0, 0, 0. 0. 0.001. We don't get any better than that, Shelly. And I think that it's important. And I think really what I wanted to highlight that for educators is that clinic, if clinical judgment is a cognitive skill that needs to be practiced repeatedly in nursing education from semester one at their level all the way through, the more that we practice it, the stronger it becomes. It's like a muscle. It's also like sterile technique. Practice it leads to perfect practice. And so we really encourage us as educators that as we integrate in best practices to teach and develop clinical judgment, it will improve the proficiency. And Shelley's article, I mean, it, it, it does have a correlation that we can't ignore. Would you agree, Shelley, or am I oh, just- Absolutely. No, it is, it's true. And I think the, that's one of the things that at our school of nursing, we, we're a new school of nursing and a new BSM program. We've been um, in existence for two years and we just graduated our first cohort of students, but we put Lassiter's rubric in every single semester, every single clinical and every single simulation. And so that's kind of a next step in yeah. one of my goals is to look at every single student across the two years and see where they started in semester one and where they ended in, in semester four to take a look at that clinical judgment to see, you know, based on that scoring system, is there an improvement? Obviously, I know there's going to be, but what is the numbers? What does that look like statistically? Um, so that's kind of a, ne a next step um, for us at our School of Nursing to take a look at. Excellent. That's really cool. When you were talking, Shelly, I was just thinking what great ways you have to integrate reflection. Because one thing that's coming out to me is it seems like with these tools of reflection, students have time to think. And I feel like with patient situations that happen really fast, they miss a lot. Even we have done recording in SIM before, and it's neat to see what they miss when they watch the recording. They're like, oh my gosh. I did this or I did that, or I said this or I said that, or let me think what I was thinking because it was happening so fast. So they, it's like, we're slowing this down. We're giving them all this time to think. And like you said, Keith, we're like repeating it over and over to strengthen that muscle. That's so cool. What did students say then, Shelly? Did they give you guys feedback? They do. And actually we ask them at the end of every course, um, how do you like watching your videos and what have you taken from using those videos? Um, and we have an article that's um, hopefully going to get published shortly um, on just that topic. Um, what did they learn? Um, but they, some of them are intimidated by watching themselves. They don't want to see themselves. They don't like hearing themselves. Um, but the majority of them will say, like, I am so grateful to have seen the video. I can't believe how many times I've said, OK, I can't believe how I just stood in the corner and I didn't communicate. I can't believe that I never talked to my peers in the room. Um, I can't believe I broke sterile technique. You know, like I'm going to go back to the skills lab and practice that now. So I think it's um, they really enjoy oh, this. that. Mm -hmm. You know, we are just, it's already an hour and I usually, we've got to kind of wrap it up and I'm going to make a last call for questions. I do, I'm, it takes about a 30 second delay. So if you are watching and have a question that has not been addressed, you've got an expert panel right in front of you. Don't waste this opportunity. But I will share while I'm waiting for a comment or two or for any questions to come in. I do have a couple of things I'd love to kind of throw on the on the chat, on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, this educator said, faculty development, love it. How do we train nurse educators to be in the same caliber as yourselves? Show me, walk me through. How does that look like we are thrown in, LOL? Mm -hmm. You know, no, none of us are born with the knowledge base. It's a process. But any comments or encouragement, you would just kind of say, how do we strengthen ourselves yeah. as educators? You know, we're all works in progress. I know yeah. I am. Mm -hmm. and I know Definitely. You know, so how do you see it? 
for, you know, for our school of nursing, like I said, we're new, only two years out. And so everybody came in at the same time. Everybody's new. And I'm, you know, I was just one person trying to mentor everybody and get everybody on board. But now that we've got a full, we got like 15 faculty. And as we continue to grow and continue to bring in more faculty, that is our next step. Where, how can we develop a mentoring program, um, an orientation program that's going to be a little more robust versus it just being, you know, um, one month long or two weeks long, and then, you know, you're kind of out there. Um, we never want to throw anybody into the, into the wolves that like, we want everybody to be trained. Um, I put together a clinical judgment video where I um, talk about clinical judgment. I talk about how we teach it. We use a Caputi framework, which we didn't get into and that's okay. We don't have to, um, but we use a framework to help guide our questions and our thinking processes. So I give that to the incoming adjunct faculty as well as full-time faculty, because adjunct, that's another big piece of it is there a lot of times aren't, you know, with us all of the time and they're out on their own in clinical and we need them to also be on the same page with the clinical judgment and the questions and how to do the reflecting. Um, but Diane, that's a big piece. How are we going to mentor? What are we going to mentor? How, what does that look like? I think that's going to possibly be a um, topic in Icon Ed that we're going to investigate. What is currently out there and how do we proceed with that? Um, but we need it. It absolutely because it's not it's not always in the nurse educator programs with the master's degree and not everybody becomes that went through a master's degree did it as a nurse educator master's degree. Many of them are coming in and they're nurse practitioners, but they're teaching at a BSN level and they've they've not been taught how to teach. I think that's so true. And I realized that too. Going, I went through a master's in nurse education and now I'm in a PhD program in nurse education. And I'm just like mind blown every single course. Like there's so much to learn out there about being a nurse educator. So uh, for me, um, it's like he said, you just, you take the time to learn, right? And and Shelly has a great program, like she's describing a great model of making sure we make faculty development a priority. But if that's not available to you, then you protect your own time and you make it a priority for yourself. And the reason why I think goes right back to how we started our conversation at the top of the hour is, we as nurse educators are impacting so many students and those students are saving lives and, and, and making a difference in their patients' lives. So for me, I take it very seriously because I'm an extension then of these students in practice for these patients. Mm -hmm. And so if I have it, clinical reasoning and judgment development is important because how well these students or new graduates catch patient decline how well they protect their patients, how well they speak up for their patients really depends on how well I'm teaching them now. I mean, they're going to learn and grow. It's not all on us. And, you know, but but that's the frame of mind that I have when I'm mm -hmm. like, no, I'm protecting my time. I'm going to make sure that I spend, go to this conference, go to that conference, make sure that I'm learning about these strategies, reading these articles. So I feel like that's really important. And I hope that you guys as nurse educators will be empowered to do that. And to have conversations, it's great to have a community. It's great to have people that you can talk to and challenge each other and share ideas. Maybe even one tip you can do is just have like 10 minutes at a nursing program meeting where you guys talk about these things. Like every nursing program meeting, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and then you just move through slowly together. I've been diving into this maybe for the last 10 years. I don't know about you, Shelly. So for me, it's been like a 10 year journey in clinical judgment. How about you, Shelly? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it takes time. Yeah. It wasn't built in a day, just like Rome. It takes yeah. time. It takes time. And, you know, a couple of closing comments I want to encourage you all with is that uh, this person, uh, Tricia, said this. I love that you're referring to all the greats of nursing ed, Tanner, Lassiter, Nielsen, <laughs> Go Acne. That's the Oregon Consortium for Nursing Education. If you're not familiar, they are they were at the forerunners. They were they were groundbreakers on clinical judgment with Tanner leading the way, Lassiter following close behind, and Nielsen, a part of that, those homies. And they really are still trailblazers. And we need to listen and we need to apply and make operationalize their body of work. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's there. We just have to do it. And so, yes, I'm a fan of Acne and I value what they've done. And so you might be in Oregon, Tricia. That's my <laughs> gut. But, uh, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing and continue to do out there. And so anyways, I just got a couple of closing comments. Diane says this. This is gold. 
Thank you. And thank you know, you. it's really our pleasure. We thank you mm -hmm. for being here, Diane, and for everyone who's attended this and has stayed for the hour. It's our pleasure to serve your needs. And, uh, and so basically just uh, other comments about just the importance of webinars and faculty development and some of the resources that I offer uh, in Keith RN, as well as Hazel saying this, you guys are great. It's definitely an honor to hear the wealth of wisdom from you all. And you know what? That is our closing comment and no other questions. And so I feel a lot of love in the chat, Lisa and Shelly. What about you? Am I? Yes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We appreciate yeah. it. And so you're you know, going to the NLN conference. Maybe we'll see you. Are you going, Shelly? I'm going to be no, there this year. Not, not this year. I'm not. Next year. Okay. Go next year. Well, listen, I'll just close <laughs> with this thought. And then Shelly and, uh, and, uh, and Lisa stay with me here. But I would just say this is that we're going to be doing this uh, coming back to you next uh, on September 14th on the topic of uh, an, uh, an educator on the topic of human trafficking in the nursing curriculum. What can we do as nurse educators to notice human trafficking victims that come into healthcare settings? Did you know that 80 percent of trafficking victims, whether they be children, young men, women or adults, 80 percent at some point in their journey of trafficking? In the United States, will come across, will be in your healthcare setting, ER, med surge, wherever. We need to notice them, and I'm going to be. I'm excited to have an an author, uh, an educator who has also uh, written an article that is a must read. That I'm going to just put the link in the chat on nursing students' knowledge and exposure to human trafficking content in the undergrad curriculum. You know what the bottom line is? We're silent currently. We don't teach it. And we need to. And we're going to talk about how we can make a difference to integrate in a concise way uh, this aspect of noticing and interpreting the you know vict human beings that are being trafficked. That's something that we all need to be a part of and be part of the solution. So hopefully we'll join you and see you next month. And thank you again for your time. It's been a pleasure to uh, to serve with you all. And thank you again, Anne and uh, Shelley and uh, Lisa for joining us tonight. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good night.